one of these days I am going to flip the camera and show you behind the scenes <laughs> what goes on behind the camera. You would all be horrified. You would you would be horrified. It's shameful. booktube it's kim at middle of the book march and this is my bookish week for october 1st saturday october 1st and it is my favorite month of the entire year my favorite season i know it sounds cliche but it just is i live in new england it's gorgeous here in the autumn in october and i can't wait i can't wait to get started i can't wait to wear sweaters and fleeces and uh, eat a lot more hot foods and hunker down at home and Go to the different fall festivals and the state and town fairs, all of that stuff. See the pumpkins everywhere? It's my favorite. <laughs> so, so I had a busy bookish week last week. I actually finished six books. Now, five of them were shorties. So, five? Yes, five of them were shorties. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you them in order of how much I liked them. So, going from... Um, least liked to most liked and I'll get going quickly um I was sorry to say that this book did not work for me this is The Road Past Altamont by Gabrielle Roy this is translated from the French by Joyce Marshall and this is a series of four linked short stories about uh, a young girl named Christine and I one of the reasons it didn't work for me was I am not a fan of child storytellers, child narrators, child main characters. It just does not work. It, I don't even know. I can't even think of any exceptions. I'm sure there are some, but this one, um, I really, I didn't enjoy it that much. And it was like short stories because each of the four stories or chapters um, were different, very different, even though they had some the similar characters. So the writing was, was nice. It was really good, but I would rather have read a novel. Um, and I was, I was kind of sorry because this was a gift from, uh, Dia from novel, a novel idea for my birthday. And I know that she loves this book, but for me, it was just, it was not the book for me, <laughs> but uh, definitely for somebody else who likes these types of books, it's it's well written. It's a quiet kind of a tone, interlinked short stories, um, child narrator that throughout the book does age somewhat. So yeah, that's the basic gist of that. The next one, oh, I was so mad, so mad because this was really, I was really highly anticipating this one. And I read this as a buddy read with the wonderful Joe Smith, who uh, is all over BookTube. This woman gets around BookTube. She's everywhere, but she does not have a channel. She is a subscriber and a commenter and a wonderful friend to so many BookTubers. But she and I read Woman of Light by Kelly Fajardo and Steen. This is her f debut novel. She is the author of the short story collection, Sabrina and Karina. I don't remember when that came out, the year before, a couple years ago. This one, um, I just was was dying to read. And so, <sighs> I'm mad because I was so disappointed in this book. This is the story of Luz, who is um, an indigenous young girl in the 30s, yeah, 1930s, Denver, Colorado. And she is part of a group of indigenous people who are often mistaken for Mexican people because in Colorado in the 30s, there were very distinct separations between people, white people, um, brown people, uh, Native Americans or indigenous people, um, Mexican people, Hispanic people. So it was kind of de to be determined by the white community uh, where she came from. And so the racism was rampant at that time in this part of this, the country. And uh, yeah, and Luz is our main character. The book starts off, she's a teenager, but it goes backward and forward in time. And it's it states in the very beginning that the book is supposed to cover um, four generations, or actually, 
it, it talks about a fifth generation, but they're not here yet. So in the very beginning of the book, it has this generational um, table or list of all the characters in which generations. Uh, that, that was not necessary. The only reason I think it would be necessary is because the author jumped backward and forward in time so many times. So Luz has a brother named Diego, and they live in poverty with their aunt, Maria Josie. Um, and we, we, we're basically going backward and forward in time to hear the, the generational stories, to hear the, the people that Luz and Diego came from. And it's generational poverty, generational violence. Um, uh, she tried to do far too much in this book. She didn't delve into any topic very deeply. It was a very superficial jump between topics. The characters were very stereotypical. And in the entire book, Luz, who is the main protagonist, was the most um, boring and shallow character in the entire novel. There, there was no, there was nothing to hang on to with her. There was, I, I could not really relate to her or sympathize with her. I didn't really understand her motivations. And she was very flat, written very flatly. Um, the author goes into so many different important topics, racism, um, class distinction, abject poverty, uh, all kinds of things, um, violence against women. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of stuff in here that she introduces and then never goes anywhere with it. There were a lot of details that were totally unnecessary. That the, those are the types of things that, that stop me in my reading and make me question, do I need, how much of this do I need to remember? How is this going to tie into the rest of the book? It didn't. And there was a lot of it. And this was also quite overwritten. Every other sentence was highly descriptive. And it's exhausting. That's exhausting. And it wasn't done well enough so that I thought it was beautiful writing. There's an enormous amount of potential in this book. She has potential. But I just, no. And I was like, and the ending was, was so tightly wound in a nice, pretty bow for a happily ever after that it was so unrealistic that it was maddening. And um, I was really upset by that. I was really looking forward to that book. The next one is Sleepless Nights by Elizabeth Hardwick. Um, this is exactly what the title kind of says it is. This was published, I believe, in 1975, 1979. And Elizabeth Hardwick was a contemporary of Joan Didion and Susan Sontag. She was a, um, liter a literary critic and author and essayist. This is, this is purported to be a novel, but it's exactly what it says. It's, it's the ramblings of a woman that is suffering from insomnia and or uh, has intense anxiety as she's trying to lay down to go to bed and can't. And so this is written in a bunch of vignettes and it's pieces and snippets of thoughts and it's little tiny pieces of sentences uh, strung together. Each of the sentences is, is written extremely well, but they don't make sense together. She jumps all over the place talking about her family. She grew up in Kentucky, um, uh, her siblings, um, her mother. She loved her mother, but didn't understand her mother. How she travels all, all over the world, Kentucky, Amsterdam, New York, New England. And it's, it's, all, it's like a fever dream. It's like reading somebody's fever dream. It's not really fiction and it's not really nonfiction. It's almost auto-fiction, like highly biograph autobiographical fiction. But it was okay. But, you know, I, there's so many places where I'm like, wow, that's a friggin' awesome sentence. Or the writing is spectacular. But it, this is not a straightforward narrative novel. This is just her writing down a bunch of thoughts and sentences and paragraphs and vignettes and snapshots and glimpses into a woman's sleepless night. Now, this book is going to come up in another video I'm planning. Stay tuned. That's all I'm going to tell you. Um, let's see. Let's see. Which one do I want to tell you about next? I read one book on my Kindle. And this one is Ace and Proud, an asexual anthology, which was edited by A.K. Anderson. 
Uh, this is this is, was a great book, and I had read Ace by Angela Chen last year, I think. Um, and the, both of the books are very similar in that they are excellent primers in learning more about asexuality and the different levels on the spectrum and the different definitions, what it all means. This book is um, kind of sponsored by the website AVEN, which is asexuality.org, I believe. And I will put that information in the description box below. But it's an anthology, so different writers are submitting different chapters and sections. Um, it was really good. It was very, very good. It's actually really good for a younger person, especially somebody either in high school or an older teenager. I really liked it because I learned so much from it. But it was a little repetitive, and I knew I, I already knew a lot of the information, which is fine. But I still think it's a really great book, and as is a a Angela Chen's book, Ace. So this was a very good book to hand to somebody. It's very short. I believe it's only on Amazon, if I understand correctly. I'll, I'll look into that and put that in the description box. Um, but I do highly recommend it. It's, it will help you understand what asexuality is and the different definitions. Um, asexuality is on a spectrum, just like a lot of other things. And with better exposure, we have better understanding. So I really did enjoy reading those, those anth that anthology and different essays and stories. This one is another anthology and another um, essay collection. This is Don't Call Me Crazy, 33 Voices Start the Conversation About Mental Health, and this is edited by Kelly Jensen. I started off reading this on ebook and I bought a copy because I liked it that much. This is, again, 33 um, essays talking about mental health. There's so much in here. There's There are essays about eating disorders, bipolar disorder, um, OCD, um, anxiety disorders, uh, agoraphobia. Um, let's see, what was the other one? Body dysmorphic disorder. There's all depression. There's all kinds of essays in here. There are poet poems, drawings, um, stories. I think there were a couple of stories, but this has this includes the voices of many people that you would know. Uh, Kristen Bell is in here talking about depression. Um, Nancy Kerrigan is in here talking about perfectionism and anxiety. Uh, Esme Weijun Wong is in here. She is the author of The Collected Schizophrenia. She's in here. Um, who is the other young man? I'm trying to find his... Reed Ewing. If you've ever watched Modern Family, Reed Ewing played the character Dylan, who was... Um, oh gosh, what was her name? Haley. <laughs> Haley's um, boyfriend at the end of Modern Family. He suffered from body dysmorphic disorder and went through multiple plastic surgeries to make himself look a certain way. And he has a, an essay in here that is very poignant and um, unbelievable, but so helpful and, and exposes what this disorder is. This was very good. This is actually marketed toward kids and young people. I think it's a little mature for kids, but definitely for teenagers, this would be very helpful to put in schools. And I really learned so much. I got a lot out of it. Um, I I really liked it. Is that it? No, I have one more. Do I have one more? I have one more. Now, this is my five-star read. Um, and I just finished this and I thought, I don't believe, I didn't believe I never read this before because I thought it was spectacular. And this is Corregidora by Gail Jones. Uh, I am blown away by this book. This is a book that is extremely disturbing, um, filthy, um, violent. <laughs> this reminded me of, now, I'm going to compare, I'm going to mash together a couple of books, and I hate it when people do that. I hate it when publishers do it. But this, to me, read like a combination of Toni Morrison's Beloved and Fernanda Melchor's Hurricane Season. This is the story of Ursa Corregidora, and she is a jazz singer in the Kentucky in the 40s. Uh, yeah, she's a Kentucky blues singer, not jazz, blues singer. She she is the daughter of a line of women who were raped and impregnated by a slave owner, a uh, Portuguese slave owner. And 
it, it, there's so much degradation and violence and fear written throughout the story. Um, she is pissed off, rightly so, justifi justifiably so, by her own family legacy. She has been raised since a young child by her great-grandmother, her grandmother, and her mother to know of the stories of how these women lived, how they were raped, abused, violated, um, humiliated, and how this Portuguese slave owner, Corregidora, uh, raped his slave, uh, impregnated her. She bore a daughter. He raped his own daughter. She bore a child, and so on and so on. And so he it was just generations of violence and rape and abuse um, and humiliation. I keep saying the same words, but I can't help myself. The writing is spectacular. She writes in conversational style. It's not dialect, but you you can almost overhear the conversations between the characters. And what she does is she's writing Ursa's story throughout, but in between she's interspersing italicized sections of history. And she is bringing the past to the forefront and telling the reader what had happened in uh, Ursa's family and her family legacy. And each of the women before her kept telling her, you have to create generations. These stories cannot die. These are our stories. These are the stories of black women. These are the stories of enslaved women. Uh, you, you must continue our history. But at the very beginning of the book, she's pushed down the stairs by her husband at the time and has to have surgery to remove her uterus. And at the time, she was two months pregnant. So she could no longer uh, give birth to children. And she is mourning and bemoaning the fact that she will no longer be able to create generations to keep the stories and the history alive. And so it, it completely affects her present in her relationships with men, in her uh, self-esteem and her confidence in herself as a woman. There's so much in here to discuss. It was just a spectacular book, a very hard read. This, was n this would not be for a sensitive reader or somebody who could be triggered by discussions of rape, abuse, slavery, um, family abuse and neglect. Uh, it would be inappropriate for that type of a reader. Um, but the writing is just remarkable. And she was kind of discovered by Toni Morrison. So um, this, this, I think... 1975. This one was published in 1975. So this is a classic, a much lesser known classic than Morrison's work, but I thought it was spectacular. And I think that's it. I think, did I talk about six books in less than in 18 minutes? Yeah, I think I did. Did I? Yes, I did. Wow. It's a record. It's a new record. So um, Shorty September is over. I still have some shorties left. I'm, I'm not going to say much more, but I am going to post a Shorty September analysis video next week. So keep your eye out for that. Um, I, I can't, I'm going to have a great weekend. Um, I'm not telling you anything about that yet either. That'll come next week. I know a lot. I have a lot of secrets, people. So let me know in the comments below what you think. Let me know if you're reading some good stuff and I'll see you in the next video. Bye everybody.